question number one. So today's topic is about how to investigate kidney disorders. Just like last time, it is another very important basic topic. Now, this topic will be discussed under different headings. First of all, I'll talk about glomerular filtration rate or GFR. So what is the importance of uh, doing GFR in clinical practice? And how to estimate GFR? That will be followed by blood urea, nitrogen, and serum creatinine, which are also known as renal function test. Okay? So you have heard renal function test in clinical medicine. What do you mean by that? That is mainly comprises of BUN and serum creatinine. After that, we'll discuss in detail about urine analysis. What are the different components of urine analysis in the hospital? Uh, under urine analysis, many different subheadings are there, like how you judge different type of diagnosis by appearance of the urine. What do you mean by pH and specific gravity of the urine and why we uh, examine them? Or why we discuss about them? What is the importance of them? Followed by, you know, appearance of glucose in the urine and appearance of protein in the urine. What are the importance? What is the meaning of presence of pus cells in the urine? What happens if RBCs is present in the urine? What happens if ketone bodies are present in the urine? And how we detect bacteria in the urine? So all these things we'll discuss in detail inside the urine analysis. Now that will be followed by different radiological tests. You should just know the name there. And finally, we'll complete the topic by discussing kidney biopsy. What are the different indications? So let's start. Now. First on the list is GFR or global blood filtration rate. Now in the beginning, you should know what is the meaning of GFR. Now your meaning is right there in the, in the term itself. Glomerular filtration rate. Glomeruli are the special capillaries which are present inside the Bowman's capsule of the nephron. And what is their job? Their job is to filter the blood. Whatever blood is flowing through the glomeruli, it will filter that blood and form glomerular filtrate into the Bowman's capsule. So glomerular filtration rate is how much glomerular filtrate is formed inside the Bowman's capsule per a unit of time that is called GFR. And in clinical practice, we usually uh, discuss the GFR in ml per minute. Now, what is a normal GFR? You all know, isn't it? You have done this in physiology. It is around 120 ml per minute. That means when the blood is constantly flowing into the glomeruli, that much, okay, that much filtrate is formed inside the Bowman's capsule. That is called glomerular filtration rate. Now, in health or in healthy people, the glomerular filtration rate, a GFR, remains remarkably constant because of some intra-renal regulatory mechanism. This is very true in most of the organ. Okay? Our body can regulate the mechanism by itself at the local level. So in kidney also, that GFR can be maintained or can be kept constant because of these regulatory mechanisms. Now, what I'm saying here, if GFR falls, okay, if GFR falls less than 120 ml per minute, that means something is seriously wrong, okay? Why? Because once the regulatory mechanism also fell, then only GFR will fall. So, GFR will fall under this situation. Number one, when there is decreased blood flow to the kidney. It is very true, isn't it? If blood flow itself is less, then definitely GFR will fall. Now, in which situation there is decreased blood flow to the kidney? Think about it. It's a very important question which we'll, we'll ask all the time to our students. One of the important uh, condition is hypovolemia. Now, the causes of hypovolemia are so many, isn't it? One is serious trauma leading to massive hemorrhage. Another is 
high hypovolemic shock because of severe dehydration as a result of diarrhea and vomiting okay or burns or sometimes because of heart failure the blood flow itself is less towards the kidney now second condition when gfr falls is when there is serious loss of the glomeruli which occurs in chronic glomerulonephritis or in chronic renal failure or there is acute inflammation of the glomeruli like in acute glomerulonephritis in both condition gfr will fall the third one fine so let's talk like this the glomeruli are fine here okay they are normal they are healthy they are doing the job that means the glomerular filtrate is formed after the filtrate is formed inside the bowman's capsule where it will go it will go into the proximal convoluted tubules now from the proximal convoluted tubule it will go into the loop of henle then distal convoluted tubule and then collecting duct okay, that's how the filtrate process now think about the situation here inside those tubules or inside the loop of henle if there is some obstruction to the flow of this ultra filtrate then also there is development of the back pressure and that back pressure will decrease the gfr <clears throat> now what is the importance of gfr you all know because of this glomerular filtration rate or because of the function done by this glomeruli the waste product which are present in our blood is getting out okay as the urine so if gfr falls the ability to eliminate this waste product whatever are present inside the blood will be less that means they will be collected inside the blood okay and this can cause serious damage in different organ of our body this will cause acidosis in our body this will cause hypervolemia in our body and this will also lead to electrolyte imbalance these are very very important consequences now how we know how we know clinically if gfr is low or not you can simply do serum creatinine level that is a very specific for the gfr than blood urea because blood urea is affected by so many other variables but serum creatinine is directly okay proportional to the fall in gfr that's why in clinical practice we will love to measure serum creatinine level and accordingly we will we'll judge how much gfr is there in the patient now let's talk a little bit about blood urea remember blood urea and serum creatinine are the important part of renal function test now in healthy subjects there is an enormous reserve of renal function that means blood urea and serum creatinine do not rise above the normal range until there is a reduction of 50 to 60 percent in the gfr so let me make it easier for you if our kidneys are not damaged more than 50 to 60 percent okay if our kidneys are not damaged more than 50 to 60 percent then there will be no rise in blood urea and serum creatinine if our kidneys are damaged around 30 to 40 percent the blood urea and serum creatinine are still within the normal limit that is the meaning so if a patient comes to the hospital and if you have measured renal function test that means blood urea and serum creatinine and if they are high that means the kidneys are already seriously damaged okay. that is the meaning now the urea is affected by many different variables okay. we'll talk about that what are those situation where urea is high in the blood it doesn't only occur in renal diseases it can occur in so many other different conditions and the normal level of urea is 15 to 40 mg per deciliter or in millimole per liter it is 2.5 to 6.6 now i advise my students to remember in mg per deciliter range okay this is how 
we have also learned in during our MBBS days, and we also teach our students to remember this. This is easy for you. So I want you to remember this value of urea, 15 to 40 milligram per deciliter. Now there is one common, you know, misconception among the students. What is the difference between blood urea, nitrogen, and blood urea? Are the same term or is there some difference between them? Isn't it? So let's talk a little bit about it. They are not same. There is a difference between them. BUN or blood urea nitrogen reflects only the nitrogen content of the urea. Okay. And the molecular weight of that is 28. And urea measurement or blood urea measurement reflects the whole of the molecule where the molecular weight is 60. So what do you mean by that? Urea is approximately twice that of BUN. Okay, so urea is approximately twice that of the BUN. To be very precise, it is 2.14 times the blood urea nitrogen value. So there is one example which is given in the slide. If BUN is 10 milligram per deciliter, then urea would be 21.4 milligram per deciliter. That means urea is around 2.14 multiplied by the BUN value. So that is the difference. So from today onwards, please remember they are not the same term. Now, what are the factors which influence uh, blood urea or serum urea level? See that there are the two parts of the table here. On one part, uh, I mentioned about these are the conditions, uh, these are the situation where the production of the urea is increased. Okay, so let's talk about that. High protein diet will increase the production of urea because urea is uh, considered uh, one of the end product of protein metabolism. Actually, urea is synthesized by liver, okay, from ammonia and ammonium is or ammonia is one of the end product of the protein metabolism that is the relation if there is increased catabolism in our body because of major surgery because of infection widespread infection or because of severe trauma then also urea level will be high it will be high maybe because of corticosteroid therapy or glucocorticoid therapy because of gi bleeding Remember, in case of upper GI hemorrhage or even lower GI hemorrhage, urea will be high. And even in cancer, okay, disseminated cancer, urea level will be high. So that's why I have told you urea is increased not only in the renal diseases, it is affected by so many different conditions. Now, the level of urea is high in the blood if there is decreased elimination, isn't it? If there is decreased elimination. Now let's let's talk about that. In which which condition there is decreased elimination, okay, of the blood urea from the kidney. The tops, I mean the most common cause in this list is glomerular diseases, acute glomerular nephritis or chronic glomerular nephritis, when there is decreased blood flow to the glomerular itself, like in hypotension or severe dehydration, okay? This is also a very important one. In case of urinary obstruction, okay, like hydronephrosis, this is called post-renal obstruction. And in case of tubulointerstitial nephritis, okay? Different disorders of the tubules where there is blockage of the filtrate to flow and development of the back pressure. All these are important condition where blood urea is high. Now, let's talk in the opposite way. What are the conditions where blood urea is decreased? Okay, let's talk about decreased synthesis first. If we take low protein diet, if there is reduced catabolism inside the body, like in old age, and in case of liver failure or liver diseases, liver is the organ which synthesizes urea, we all know that. So these are the situations where urea synthesis itself is less. As a result of that, the blood urea or blood urea nitrogen will be low. On the other hand, 
okay? If there is increased elimination of urea from the kidney, then also the level will be low. And that can happen in one of the physiological conditions known as pregnancy, where GFR is usually higher. So urea level may be low in the blood. Revise this, this uh, slide many times till you are quite certain about it because these are the important points. Now, on the other hand, serum creatinine, okay? Now, what determines the creatinine level in the blood, okay? And what is the importance of this? Let's talk about it. The level of creatinine is much less dependent on diet, but is more related to age, sex, and muscle mass. That's why if you want to estimate GFR, serum creatinine value, it's much more, you know, important than blood urea. We always correlate serum creatinine level with GFR than blood urea nitrogen. The normal level of serum creatinine is 0.6 to 1.36 milligram per deal. And in some of the textbook, it is also written as 0.6 to 1.4 milligram per deciliter. Now, these are the factors which influence serum creatinine level. These are the conditions of the factor which increase the production of serum creatinine. Now, many students probably are thinking at this time, what is this creatinine actually? From where it comes? What is the origin of this? Okay, so let me highlight a little bit about it. Inside our muscle, there is a special substance known as creatine. This creatine can be utilized by the muscle as a source of energy. Okay, and creatinine is one of the product of creatine. Now this creatinine is a waste product and this creatinine should be excreted from the kidney. So that's what we are talking right now. So production of creatinine is increased by breakdown of the muscles, which is known as rhabdomyolysis. So if the breakdown is excessive, then there is more synthesis of the creatinine. Now, can you tell me one or two situations where there is excessive breakdown of the muscle? Yes, heat stroke is one of them. Heat stroke, okay, very uh, serious emergency situation where there is massive rhabdomyolysis. Another one is severe trauma. For example, a stampede type of injury, okay, a victim of earthquake. Remember that type of example. And when there is increased muscle mass also, then there is increased production of the creatine because it depends on the muscle mass. Now, creatinine level is high in the blood because of decreased elimination as well, which can occur in renal failure when kidneys are not working. If the tubular secretion of creatine is blocked by certain substances, which is called competitive tubular secretion, like trimethoprim, semetidine, spironolactone, and amyloride. These are different drugs which will block the competitive tubular secretion of creatinine, which results in increased level of creatine in the blood. And I'm sure you all know what are the use of this drug. Okay, a, a quick uh, you know line about this: trimethoprim. Is a type of antibiotic. It is one of the component of cotrimoxazole. Simetidine. Can you tell me which which a type of drug is this? Good. This is H2 receptor blocker. So it is used in the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. Spironolactone and amyloride are the special diuretics. They are called potassium sparing diuretic. Now. These are the conditions where uh, serum creatinine level is high. But in which condition serum creatinine level may be low? In case of malnutrition, isn't it? Where there is very small muscle mass. After going through these renal function tests, let's talk about what are the different stages of renal failure. Okay, now, what do you mean by that? Let's discuss this by giving different examples. There are three patients who came to our hospital with different GFR. One patient comes with the GFR of around 70 ml per minute. Another patient comes with GFR of 30 ml per minute. And third patient comes with GFR of 10 ml per minute. 
Now, in which stages of renal failure are they? Okay, this this table will clearly discuss about that. So, if GFR is still more than ninety, but less than one hundred and twenty mL per minute, okay, this is stage not or stage zero of renal failure. Means the risk factors are present for chronic kidney disease in this case, but actually not most problem has it happened to the patient. Stage one, the GFR is still more than 90, but less than 120 with demonstrated kidney damage now. And that is highlighted by persistent proteinuria, abnormal urine sediment, okay? Abnormal urine sediment means different cast, for example. Abnormal blood and urine chemistry, increased blood urea nitrogen, or uh, different substances are present in the urine and abnormal radiological test as well. So what is the difference between stage not and stage one? In both cases, remember, the glomerular filtration rate is still more than 90, but in stage one, there is definitive damage to the kidney. Stage two is known as mild renal failure. Now the GFR definitely falls below 90. It will reach up to 60. Stage three is moderate uh, renal failure. Now here, the GFR still falls, it may reach up to 30. Stage 4, the GFR is between 15 to 29. And stage 5 is also known as ESRD, also known as end stage renal disease, where GFR is less than 15. Now, this is a very critical situation. A patient cannot survive until and unless some specific therapy is provided in this case. And those specific therapy are only two. One, renal transplantation. Another one is regular dialysis. Now, how to estimate GFR in clinical practice? Okay, you should just know the headings here, okay? Nobody is going to ask in detail regarding this. One is called inulin clearance. Okay, inulin clearance. This is considered as the gold standard for the physiologist, okay? But it is not very practicable in clinical medicine. Second one is called creatinine clearance. And this is the formula by which we calculate creatinine clearance. Now, creatinine clearance is equivalent to urine concentration multiplied by the volume of the urine uh, divided by plasma concentration. Okay. This is how creatinine clearance is calculated. And the normal range in male, 90 to 140 ml per minute. In female, 80 to 125 ml per minute. So this is a quite a big range there. The third important way of estimation of GFR is radionuclide label marker, such as 125I iothalamate. I means iodine. 125 iodine iothalamate. This is the name of a radioactive material which may be used for the estimation of GFR. And there is one formula which we can use on the bedside, which is called Cockrock Gold formula. You can clearly see there, you can roughly calculate GFR with the help of this formula. Now, one question always comes here why we need to know GFR clinically? Let's take a situation here. I'm going to prescribe a medicine for my patient. Before I prescribe the medicine, I must know how the kidneys are working because most of the drugs are excreted by kidneys. So if GFR is low, that means kidneys are not functioning properly. So maybe I need to decrease the dose of the drug or maybe I need to change the drug and I need to switch another drug. I need to switch to the another drug which probably is not metabolized or excreted by the kidney. Now I have reached to a very, very important part of this lecture that is urine analysis. Urine analysis is one of the commonest type of investigation which is done every day in the hospital. Urine analysis is also known as liquid biopsy of the kidney. Okay, so that shows the importance of this test. It helps to uncover renal parenchyma and urinary tract diseases. Okay, many different types of kidney dysfunctions or disorders can be diagnosed simply by urine analysis. And in the beginning, we should know 
how to collect the urine in clinical practice. For example, we have asked the patient uh, to go to the lab for urine analysis, but they may not know how to collect the urine sample. So it's, it's the job of the doctor or the lab personnel to tell them how urine uh, is collected. So there are important three methods. The first one is the most commonly done, which is called midstream urine collection. Midstream urine collection. So we have to describe this to the patient, okay? And the patient has to exactly follow how we describe it. Catheter specimen is the second one, and suprapubic aspiration is the third. Catheter and suprapubic aspiration usually uh, collect very pure form of urine, means the sample which we get is not contaminated, but midstream urine collection may be contaminated if the patient doesn't know how to collect properly. Now, what are the different components of urine analysis? Look at that slide or the table, very nicely written there. Routine microscopy, routine test and microscopical test. I, should, I can also say like that. Now, first is appearance of the urine. What is the color of the urine? From the color itself, we can diagnose so many different conditions. What is the specific gravity and osmolality of the urine? That means how heavy is the urine? Okay, we'll talk about that. What is the importance of doing urinary pH? And what are the different types of STIX test? Okay, these STIX tests are also known as strip test. These strips are already uh, available. Okay, these are already available in different pharmacy. I can simply or inside the hospital. So we can simply dip these sticks on a sample of urine and it will give us different values. So glucose, ketone body, presence of RBC, presence of protein in the urine, and even the presence of bacteria in the urine can be analyzed by chemical or sticks or strip type of test. With the help of microscopy, we can count how many cells are there, how many red cells are there, is there presence of cast or not, bacteria or not, and crystals or not. These are the component of microscopic analysis of the urine. The urine analysis uh, has both component routine test and microscopic test. Now, the appearance of the urine can give different diagnosis. See that? Urine looks red in hematuria, okay? Frank red in case of lower urinary tract bleeding, but it may be cola colored urine in upper urinary tract hemorrhage, like from the glomerular. We have discussed that before. Urine becomes very concentrated in case of dehydration, okay? In case of dehydration, that is important one. Now, there are certain other conditions where urine is discolored, okay? Normally, it is, uh, you know, very clear colored, isn't it? Like water, for example. Or sometimes when we do not drink uh, enough water, then it is slightly yellow in appearance. That is also considered fine. But in this situation, uh, the definite discoloration of the urine may occur. Like in cholestatic jaundice, also known as obstructive jaundice, where the soluble or direct component of the bilirubin is excreted and that is responsible for the high colored urine there. Hemoglobinuria, passage of hemoglobin in the urine. And remember, where is that hemoglobin normally present? Inside the RBC. When RBCs are broken down, hemoglobin will be released in the blood and that hemoglobin has passed on the urine, resulting in hemoglobinuria. Now, if a patient is taking some of the drugs like rifampicin or some of the substances like beetroot, okay, then also urine may be discolored. In rifampicin, the coloration of the urine will be like a orange color. And if we uh, did not explain this type of thing to the patient, then patient may be scared sometimes. Now, in certain condition known as porphyria or alcaptonuria, the urine become discolored after keeping for some time as the result of effect of the sunlight or 
because of the oxidation, these types of uh, you know reaction can occur in the urine. Now, what is the importance of doing urinary pH here? Okay, urine is slightly acidic in the morning. Now look at the range of the pH around 6.5 to 7, and generally becomes more alkaline during the evening time. That is around 7.5 to 8. Okay. And this urinary pH significantly goes towards the acidic in case of renal tubular acidosis. Now, what's the importance of doing specific gravity and osmolality of the urine? If that question is asked to you, you can easily explain now. Okay. Now, specific gravity is usually fixed at 1.010 in case of chronic renal failure, which is called isostheneuric urine that means the special gravity is fixed it is not high it is not it is usually fixed at a particular range and that can be explained by the failure of counter current regulatory mechanism in case of chronic renal failure the urine is diluted in that situation now there are two other conditions which i want to highlight here there are two types of renal failure more common type of renal failure I'm talking about pre-renal failure and intrinsic renal failure. Now think very logically here, okay? This is a very important question. What happens to the specific gravity and osmolality of the urine in these two situations? Now, in pre-renal failure, the condition of the kidney is normal. Only problem is the kidney is getting decreased perfusion. So as a result of this, this kidney can absorb enough amount of water as well as electrolyte. So the specific gravity of the urine is usually high. It is usually high in this situation. But in intrinsic renal failure, kidney is damaged from the inside. That means it cannot maintain the osmolality or specific gravity of the urine. As a result of that, that would be diluted. So what happens to the specific gravity now? It will fall. It will be decreased. So this is how you understand. Now, there is one important point which is highlighted here. It is done usually in the investigation of polyuria or inappropriate ADS secretion. Now, you all know what is polyuria, isn't it? Polyuria is the excessive formation of the urea. Now, inappropriate ADH secretion means the ADH is high in the blood, okay? We do not want that amount of ADH, but somehow, because of some abnormal pathological condition, this ADH is excessively present in the blood. And what is the function of ADH? It will retain more water. As a result of more retention of the water in the body, what happens to the uh, specific gravity and osmolality? It will be increased now it will be increased. Now, let's talk exactly opposite to this. What is the exact opposite situation of inappropriate ADL secretion? Okay, diabetes insipidus, isn't it? Diabetes insipidus means lack of ADLs. Now, what happens to the uh, special gravity of the urine in diabetes insipidus? It will be decreased. It will be decreased. So this is how you understand. Now, what's the importance of detection of glucose in the urine? Now, glucose normally is not present in the urine. So if a glucose is present in the urine, that means the person may be having diabetes mellitus, okay? Or in some of the situation, the renal threshold for glucose may be low in some of the people. So even if they are not diabetic, some amount of glucose may be present in them. This is known as renal glycosuria. Okay, if ketone bodies are present in the urine, then it shows few conditions which are highlighted there. One is called starvation ketoacidosis, another is called diabetic ketoacidosis, which may occur in type 1 diabetes as a complication. And which type of ketone body appears in the urine? Okay, that is usually acetoacetate. Now, what do you mean by bacteriuria? And how we detect that? Now, bacteriuria means appearance of bacteria in the urine. Okay, 
and these are uh, detected by microscopic test as well as strip test so there are two important uh, dipstick test or strip test which are available those are called uh, nitride reduction test and leukocyte sterase test nitride reduction test and leukocyte sterase test remember the name so it's very clearly written there now let's talk about microscope of the urine fossils are present in the urine what does that signify of course that signify urinary tract infection but but is it true all the time probably not because the pus cells are also present in inflammatory condition and there is no role of infection in some of those so don't forget this important statement here presence of pus cells in the urine is not diagnostic of uti in 100% of the time yes uti is very common condition we always think about uti if this type of patient comes to us but may not be 100% okay so the definition of pyuria in female in on centrifuge midstream urine sample more than 10 wbc per cubic millimeter is abnormal and uh, in case of uh, for example if uh, the number of wbc is present less than 10 okay for example 5 to 10 what we call that this is of doubtful significance in that situation probably we need to repeat the urine test once again or treat the patient symptomatically in male in on centrifuge midstream urine sample even presence of more than 3 wbc is abnormal okay and why why this uh, you know difference is there think about it it is all because of the incidence of uti according to the sex uti is very very common in female because of some anatomical differences between them and because of some of the risk factor if number of wbc in centrifuge midstream urine in both male and female is more than 5 per hyperfill it is abnormal so um, usually they go for centri fuse urine sample in the lab so remember this more than 5 wbc are present for hyperfill that is considered presence of pus cells in the urine now there are certain condition which are known as sterile pyuric condition and these are the uh, disease diseases or disorder where sterile pyuria occurs now what do you mean by that in the beginning isn't it sterile pyuria presence of pus cells in the urine but when you culture that urine there will be no growth of the bacteria this is called sterile pyuria and these are the situation where it is seen during antibiotic treatment of urinary infection because of the antibiotic those pathogens are already killed because of urinary stone because it can just irritate that a particular area and then there is a leakage of rbc as well as wbc tubulo interstitial nephritis may be caused by inflammatory condition papillary necrosis and tuberculosis very important condition which is asked in the exam because tb okay bacilli cannot be grown properly in the ordinary culture media we need special culture media to grow tb bacilli and what is the name of that culture media lz media okay it's called lowenstein jensen media now what is the importance of detection of cast in the urine let's talk about it what do you mean by cast first this cast are cylindrical body okay cylindrical material or bodies which are present in the urine and these cast are formed when certain substance is passing through the tubules especially the distal tubules of the nephron and they are mainly formed from tam horsfall glycoprotein and certain cellular element and this tam horsfall glycoprotein are the main component of the distal tubules so this is how they are formed and this may be important mcq question for you in the exam please note it tam horsfall glycoprotein is the important constituent of the cast now these are the situation which favor formation of protein cast like low flow rate of the filtrate inside the tubules 
high salt concentration or sodium concentration and low pH of the urine. Now, there are different types of cast, okay? Physiological cast and pathological cast. Let's talk a little bit about them. The physiological cast may be hyaline cast and maybe granular cast. We, we do not ask uh, this type of questions to you. Just knowing the name will be enough. But pathological cast are very important. Like RBC cast, uh, they are seen, especially in case of bleeding, which occur at the glomerular site or glomerular area. Now, why? In the last class also, I talked about this. Because of global nephritis, there is hematuria, and those RBC pass through the tubules. That's how they form RBC cast. WBC cast are seen in infective condition now, or inflammatory condition, like acute pyelonephritis, which is a type of upper urinary tract infection, interstitial nephritis, SLE, and transplant rejection. All of those can lead to inflammation inside the kidney. Fatty cast is seen in nephrotic syndrome because nephrotic syndrome, one of the component is known as hyperlipidemia with lipiduria. When that lipid is passing through those tubules, then fatty cast will be found. Crystals in cast are seen in hypercalcemia and hyperuricosuria. Now, hypercalcemia means increased calcium level in the blood, and that calcium may be excreted in the urine. And hyperuricosuria, increased uric acid crystals. And broad waxy type of cast are seen in chronic renal failure. Now, look at this picture. This picture will clearly uh, describing how these casts are formed. See here, okay? This is epithelial cell cast, okay? When it is passing inside the lumen of these tubules, then these casts are formed, okay? So, it's very clear concept in there. And this slide is uh, telling us about different type of cast which are seen under the microscope. Okay, fatty cast, there are lipid droplets still can be seen. Hyaline cast, a bit transparent and refractile type of cast. Granular cast, some granular deposition can be seen. And waxy cast, okay. Now, waxy cast are the hallmarks of which time condition? Maybe chronic failure. Now, we have come toward the end of this topic. At the end, radiological test or kidney biopsies are left. So, what are the indications for doing radio diagnostic radiological test in kidney disorders? The plain radiograph is known as KUB X ray. So, what's the full form of KUB? Kidney, ureter, and bladder X ray. So, this is a plain X ray, and it is normally or usually done in many different types of urinary disorders, okay? The important condition which tops the list in this question is urinary tract stones, renal stone. In 90% of the time, renal stones are radio opaque. So this is the important investigation. Intravenous urography or IVU, we just uh, do this test to know where is the obstruction in the urinary tract and if that kidney is functioning or not, if that kidney is excreting the dye which we are giving intravenously. This is known as IVU. Ultrasonography is a very important test. CT and MRI can be done. Pylography, okay, pylo is renal pelvis. So it can be anterograde or retrograde. Anterograde uh, pylography is equivalent to intravenous urography, okay, a similar type of situation or investigation and retrograde means you are uh, putting uh, or injecting the dye from below. Micturating cystoerythrography or MCUZ, okay, the important type of test, especially for the diagnosis of vesico ureteric reflux, and this is done with the help of catheterization. Aortography or renal arteriography is done, especially when you suspect renal artery stenosis, and renal scintigraphy is also known as a radionuclide test in case of kidney. It is uh, usually done for the estimation of GFR. Now, what are the indications for kidney biopsy? 
remember kin de biopsy is considered very advanced type of investigation so if you are, if you do not know how to do it if you are not expert in doing uh, renal biopsy then don't go for it you can always uh, you know uh, refer this patient to the good center or higher center now important indications are acute renal failure that is not adequately explained even after good investigation we do not know what is the cause go for renal, renal or kidney biopsy chronic renal failure with normal sized kidney to go for renal biopsy just to make sure what is the cause nephrotic syndrome or glomerular proteinuria in adult in adult only in children who usually do not go for kidney biopsy uh, even in case of relapse case okay only in steroid resistance type of nephrotic syndrome uh, or steroid dependent type of nephrotic syndrome or some complicated nephrotic syndrome i'm talking about in children then you go for renal biopsy but in adult usually we go for it isolated hematuria or proteinuria with renal characteristics or associated abnormality isolated hematuria or proteinuria which is lasting for a long time and it is not disappearing at all you again go for renal biopsy now what are the contraindication for renal or kidney biopsy it's a very easy question for you never do it if there is coagulopathy in the body because there is an increased chance of continuous hemorrhage do not do it in case of high blood pressure or uncontrolled hypertension again there is high chance of hemorrhage do not go for it if kidneys are less than 60% of the predicted size because of some associated complication you may not uh, prick in the kidney itself isn't it you may prick somewhere else if you prick or if you you know make an opening in the renal blood vessels that will be a disaster and in case of solitary kidney okay uh, you do not want to damage or injure that kidney okay so these are some of the contraindication and some of the complications during renal biopsy are pain which is not that important complication frankly speaking bleeding and that bleeding may develop into clot colic which is also very rare and bleeding around the kidney especially if you do not go for what is the bleeding time in the patient what is the clotting time if there was coagulopathy already there which you fail to discover before going for the renal biopsy then uh, you know there may be a massive bleeding around the kidney okay so at the end uh, i prepared some questions for you please go through it and please give me the feedback whether this type of teaching is very helpful for you or not okay if it is not helpful i may modify the way of teaching for you thank you so much